Hello everybody and welcome to my video on this, the walls, Oops, probably on the top should show you that there, Walls Envoy 35. Okay, the Walls Envoy 35 is a 35 millimeter fixed lens range, find ca range finder camera. What that means is that it's a camera which can take any 35 millimeter film with some asterisks there. The big one being that fast films like 400 and faster are not great choices for outdoor daylight shooting. Fixed lens means that the lens on this camera is fixed, isn't going to come off. And rangefinder means that when you look through the viewfinder window on the back here, there is a, uh, there's a small image overlay that helps you ensure that you get your focus correct. The Walls Envoy 35 has no light meter, a leaf shutter with shutter speeds of one second to one five hundredth of a second as well as bulb, and the flash sync on this, it doesn't have a, uh, oh, does it, yeah it does have a flash sync, where's the connector? Oh there it is on the side. The flash sync speed on this is any shutter speed because it has a leaf shutter. And this is, insofar as I know, the only fixed lens rangefinder with a sonar lens on it. There are, there may be others, but if they exist, I don't know about them. So this is the only one that I'm aware of. There are sonar designed lenses for rangefinders like the contacts, but I believe those are all interchangeable. So in terms of fixed lens lenses, this is the only one I could find when I was looking into it for this script that has a sonar designed lens. Now you can see right here on top of the camera, so we're about to get into, this engraving is the lens formula. That's the lens design and that's how we know it's a sonar, it's a sonar design. So the target market for this was a little bit hard to know for certain because um, some of the Japanese rangefinder data is a little bit hard to come by, but if we look at the finish, the build quality, the lens and the lens specifications on this, we can assume that it is for very high-end users and it would have been targeted at the high-end market. So it has visibly nice cosmetics if you look at it around the different sides. It is an empirically nice looking camera. It has very few screws. There are only three screws that I found on this camera facing outward. So that's a sign that when they built this, they designed it to look very nice and not have distracting elements. It has a sonar lens, as we mentioned, which is a true rarity, and this is also a 48 millimeter F19 sonar lens. So that's pretty darn fast for a rangefinder from the late 50s. And the lens was made by Nitto, a company which also made lenses at the time and later for Mamiya and Ricoh cameras. And the sample images I've seen online from this lens show that it performs very well. This was, uh, it also has no light meter, by the way, which is something that would, in the late 50s, not have been that uncommon. People would still be generally carrying handheld light meters. It was made by Walls in Japan from 1959 until unknown when, when it went out of production. I couldn't find a single record of a camera from Walls that was introduced after 1959. So I assume that Walls went out of business either in the very late 50s or, or very early 60s, and that this camera was probably produced from 59 until about when they went out of business. It was preceded by the Walls 35S and followed by, like I said, probably nothing. So now as we do, we're going to go over the camera's features and functions, and we'll start here on the top. This is the film rewind knob and lever that you would use to rewind the film when you're done with your film. Walls Envoy 35, serial number. This is your film plane indicator for critical focus things such as macro and microscopy work. Accessory cold shoe, cannot fire flash from this shoe. Lens engraving, shutter release film advance lever, and manually reset frame counter. On the camera's front, 
we have the strap lugs. Walls Envoy 35 badge. We have the lens here. Later in the video we'll go over all of the markings on the lens and how to read them and understand what they're telling you. Rangefinder window. Rangefinder window right here and here. And uh, that would be a general illumination window. So this is these are the three windows for the rangefinder mechanism. As we pass this side, you can see that there's a film back re release lever right there. On the back of the camera, we have the viewfinder window and the film back. On the bottom, tripod socket, film rewind button. To get into the camera, we lift up on this little release there. The back pops open, and now we're inside the camera where we've got the film cassette chamber where you put film to shoot it. These, this guide roller here, which helps the film move smoothly through the camera. Four guide rails, two to keep the film lined up, and two to help keep it flat. Shutter box, film take-up sprocket, or tension sprocket rather, film take-up spool. A little pressure roller right there that helps keep pressure on the film right here, so that the sprocket engages the sprocket holes. And the film pressure plate right here. This sandwiches the film up against the, the guide rails here to keep it flat as it moves through the camera. Now, since we have the camera back open, let's load film and see how this works. You take your 35 millimeter film and you drop it into the cassette chamber and fiddle with the knob until it goes all the way down. There we go, just like that. Now we're gonna pull out the leader, make sure that the shutter has been fired, it has. We feed the leader into the take-up spool and the camera will then take it up, just like that. Make sure that the sprocket holes are aligned with the sprocket. And now we can close the back. Real quickly before we do, you can see here the outer film guide rails. Their job is to keep the film from moving up and down as it travels, and the inner ones, which are visible behind the sprocket holes, are going to keep the film flat when the back closes. Okay, now that we have loaded the film. This roll of film has 27 exposures on it. So what we need to do is advance this. We're going to do three frames. There we go. Now we're going to advance the frame counter until we get to uh, start the start or the first frame rather. Kind of go oh, overshot it. Well, we're just going to count that as close enough. Okay, oh, that's a little loose. That's a little bit better. Okay. And then, as you can see, we've reset the frame counter. And now as we take photos, that little index right there, that red dot, increases. You might not be able to see that with the lens I'm using right now. Increases as we take each photo. But you might be able to see that the number of the frames increases. Okay. So one thing to bear in mind about film is that it is one and done. It can record light a single time in, an, in a controlled manner with a proper shutter speed and exposure to deliver an image or in an uncontrolled manner by doing this. If you were to do this right now and open up your film back, what would happen with film in it? You would erase every photo you had already taken. So you don't want to do that. F the way that film works is it can absorb photons a single time. So if you were to take all of this film out of the cassette, every photo it could potentially take has been erased before it's even been taken. So this is just for demonstration. When you push the shutter button, oops, would help if I didn't have my finger in the wrong spot. It's, it, when you push the shutter button, what happens is that the camera advances the film onto the take-up spool, and new film from inside of the cassette is pulled out in front of the shutter box window right there over and over until you finish the entire roll. Okay, so now when you're done with your shooting your roll of film, to rewind it, you push the film back, film button down on the bottom, and, bear in, and you have to hold it on this camera. Bear in mind that you do not want to uh, open the film back just yet. And now we can rewind the film. There we go. It'll release and you'll be able to hear that sound from outside of the camera. 
just keep rewinding until you have no more tension uh, on the rewind. And now that the film is completely rewound, now you can open up the film back, lift up the knob here like this, and pull your cassette out. If you're going to continue shooting for the day, simply grab another roll of film and drop it in. If you're not, what you want to do is close the film back, put the knob down, and trigger the shutter to take any tension off of the springs. Okay, now that we've loaded and run through a roll of film and you know how to do that, we're going to talk about the flash sync on this camera. Now, when you use a flash, you will have to connect the flash to the cable port right here. And you would use a cable that looks a little bit like this one right here. I'm not going to unspool it because I don't have a flash to connect it to, but it just plugs into the uh, flash port right there. And if you had a flash that has a cable connection, you would just connect the cable to it. Okay. So you can then plug your flash right into the accessory shoe here, run the cable out to the PC port, and you can use it. Now, one thing about flashes, the worst possible place in the world to put a flash is right here on top of your camera, because the light is going to exit the flash, reach your subject, bounce back to your lens, and your subject's going to look very flat and waxy. It's not flattering. When you use a flash, you want to try to use it in a way that replicates the light that we see normally and that we would consider normal and flattering, and that is light from above. So when you're outside and it's sunny, or underneath a street light, or indoors with lights in the ceiling, we always see people and other things lit from above, and it's what our brain perceives as being normal. So you want to replicate that with your flash to have good and pleasing results. Now there are a couple of ways to do that. If you're going to put your flash on top of your camera, you can get one that tilts like this so that you can bounce the flash off of a ceiling. If you are going to be in a place without a ceiling, you, there are also ones that have articulating heads that rotate as well as tilting, and then you can bounce the flash off of a wall. Because this has a cable on it, you could use a very long cable and handhold your flash and kind of put it wherever you want, or even use an RF adapter that has a cable port on it in this, and then use an RF connector to your flash from your accessory cold shoe with a cable connecting the RF adapter to your camera. And those are some, oops, those are some, oops. Those are some of the ways that you can use a flash on this camera. Any kind of flash you would use on this, you would need to just get a manually controlled flash where you can dial in the power settings and so on and so forth in order to use it because this has no automatic flash control. So if you want to use a flash with this camera, you're gonna to have to learn, if you don't already know, some basics about flash power and guide numbers and calculations. None of it's too hard to learn. It's just a thing that you'd have to do. The next thing we're gonna do is talk about how to use the rangefinder on this camera. Okay. The, the viewfinder is right here, and this is what you're going to look through to focus. This knob right here on the lens is the focusing knob, so as you move this, the lens will focus in and out. With this camera, when you look through the viewfinder window in the back, you're going to see a frame that looks about like this. I think that's all of them. Is it? Yeah, it is. Okay. So this is what your frame is going to look like. This, these two, when you're focused beyond about seven or eight feet, I didn't see it in the manual, it didn't specify. When you're focused around seven or eight feet or beyond, this right here is the top of your frame. When you're focused a little bit closer, say seven feet and closer, this is going to be the top of your frame. And that's just a compositional aid to help account for parallax differences between your viewfinder and your actual lens orientation. Then in the middle of this area, it's not marked, but there's a little pink window right here. It's pink tinted, the same as is the frame that goes around the outside of your image. And what happens is that when you have a subject that you're focusing on, you're going to see your entire subject in your frame. Okay, and so you'll the part that you want to have focused, you'll move into the window. And now Imagine this isn't just a whole pen, but just what's in the window. When you focus, what's going to happen is that 
you're going if you're out of focus then you'll see two images as you focus correct towards correctness they'll overlap and when they overlap like this that that point that we're, that is overlapping is what's going to be in proper focus so the way that you can do use the rangefinder to very good advantage is that you can compose your image however you want so you, you'll dial in your exposure settings which we'll see in just a minute on how to do that and then let's say that you want to have a person standing over here okay you want to have your frame be your your friend over here and like a landmark or something here the Eiffel Tower you guys are having a great time visiting the Eiffel Tower and you want to capture both your friend and the Eiffel Tower in the frame but really have your friend be in focus what you do is you realign the frame so that the window is in front of your friend and you can focus then on their face and then recom keep your f don't, don't adjust your focus recompose your image like this and take your picture and now your friend is in focus and the Eiffel Tower is in the frame and that's how the rangefinder can work very well for you as a photographer okay so here we are on the camera's lens and we're going to start talking about what all of the different things on the lens are. Let's see if I can get a slightly better angle on this. Okay. So as noted a little bit earlier, here's your focusing. Okay, so you can see there's your focusing indexes. One of these, it's the one right in the middle. And it's the, one, it's the red dot there at 1.9. That's what it is. And that is where you, your lens will be focused. Now, before we go any further, you can see here that there are some indicators that go from 16 to 16. And there are some fine point indicators between each of these marked distances. Let's say that we're at F16 and we set the infinity point to line up with that 16. Everything from infinity to this point over here, which is seven feet, will be in focus at F16 with infinity at this F16. Okay, but we're not at f16. We are. At, oh, and one thing you can, one way you can make, uh, you can set to this point very easily, is if you line up the 15 feet with your focusing index right there, then you will be at your hyperfocal distance. Okay, but we're not at f16. We're at f8, and we're not going to be focusing to infinity. At f8, which is this line right here, everything from just a hair past 30 feet down to as close as something just a hair closer than 10 feet would be in focus. Okay, but we're going to focus much more closely. We're going to focus at something that is four feet away, and we're only going to be at f4. Well, here, everything from just a hair beyond four feet to just a hair short of four feet would be in focus. So this would be like a good portrait setting right here, four feet away at f4. Okay, if we were at four feet of focus at f16, everything from this 16 mark to this 16 mark, which is just shy of five feet to just more than three feet, would be in focus. So what these scales tell you is that when you select an aperture at whatever focus point you're at, the distances between the two aperture markings in kind on each side of your focus point is what's going to be in focus on your frame. Right. Next thing we're going to do is talk about this crazy ring combination up here because this is pretty intense. Okay. So if I adjust this black dial, you can see there's all of this other stuff that's adjusting in here as well. Okay. So the way that you, this was designed to use an exposure value light meter. And what you would do with the exposure value is you would grab your EV setting, which would be, let's say, 13 or 14. Those are That's pretty bright, by the way. And then it would give you your settings. So let's say that we do an exposure value reading and it tells us 15. Okay, we're going to rotate to 15. Now, let me see if I can figure out what that actually says. It says 1 1 25th and F16. Now, we don't want to do that because we don't want F16. We want a, fast, a, a wider aperture. At an EV of 15, we could go to 1 500th of a second and 
what's that, F8 sounds right, by adjusting the silver dial. So the black dial is the one that adjusts your EV range, and the silver dial is the one that adjusts your aperture and shutter speed. And the silver dial is geared so that when you dial in your EV setting, you will continue to have a proper exposure with your aperture and shutter speed. And you can also always, of course, verify that with a light meter that gives you actual aperture and shutter speed data, which most of them do now, especially all of the apps. EV light meters really have fallen out of favor and did so many decades ago. EV light meters are still used in the motion industry to an extent. So we'll change the, if you want to, when you change lighting conditions, you'll have to, or change your shutter and aperture for different lighting, you'll have to adjust the EV ring before you fine tune your aperture and shutter speed settings, okay? So just bear that in mind. When you go to change settings, first you adjust the EV ring, then you can fine tune your aperture and shutter speed. Okay, so let's say that you're using a light meter that tells you that in your lighting conditions, you need 1 1 25th of a second in f5.6. Well, let's take a look here. Right now we are at one, th right now we're at 1 30th of a second and f8. So I'm going to adjust the EV ring. Nope. I'm going to adjust the shutter speed and aperture ring. There we go. To get us to 1 1 25th of a second. So when we're, when we're dialing in a specific shutter speed and aperture, first we adjust the silver ring to get to the aperture. Now we're going to adjust the EV ring to get to the, I'm sorry, we dial this, adjust the silver ring to get to the specific shutter speed. Now we're going to adjust the EV ring to get to the aperture. Wrong way. There we go. So now we're at 1 1 25th of a second and F5.6. So when you're using an EV light meter, EV ring first. When you're using a settings light meter, which is what most all of them are now, then you use the silver ring first to adjust your shutter speed and the black ring to adjust your aperture. So a bit of a complex and wonky process that's dependent upon how you're, what type of light meter you're using to dial in your settings. Okay, so over on this side we have a switch and it's upside down for you right now, which, for which I apologize. That's an M and this is an X. M is for M bulbs, and this is your flash control switch. If you are using disposable bulbs, which means you put a different bulb in your flash every time, you can use M bulbs in this camera. You're probably not. If you're using a flash that looks like this one that we saw earlier, this is an X flash. X is for xenon. It uses a single xenon bulb over and over again. So in all probability, if you're using a flash with this camera, and I should have mentioned this during the flash segment, I just completely forgot, uh, you want to have your flash sync lever here set to X. And then the last thing on the lens is here on the bottom, and this is a self-timer lever. And uh, old rangefinder self-timers have a tendency to jam, especially in copal shutters, which is what this has. Strong recommendation, don't mess with that. Don't use the self-timer. If you really feel like you need a self-timer, get a self-timer that screws into a cable release socket because you can put that into your shutter release and you can use the self-timer that way. Okay, now we've seen how to use the lens, the rangefinder, flash, load film, basically do everything that you can do with this camera except how to actually take a picture. Okay, so what the first thing that you wanna do is get your light meter reading and you're going to dial in your light meter settings exactly as we just saw a moment ago. Great, we've got those dialed in. Okay, forgot to arm the shutter. Let's pretend I already did that and didn't just do it now. Okay, so we're ready to go here. Next thing you're gonna do is look through your viewfinder and you're going to figure out what your image is gonna look like. Find the thing that you wanna have be in focus, center your viewfinder on that, obtain the focus point. Oh, okay, that looks really good. Recompose your image for how you want it to look, take your photo. Then you advance your film and you're done with taking your photo. That's how you do it. Now, a lot of people tend to ask about double exposures with cameras. You can do a double exposure with this camera. I did not see anywhere in the manual that said you couldn't, nor does it have an apparent double exposure prevention. I would recommend not doing it uh, if you do want to do attempt it, it uses the standard hold 
hold the uh, rewind knob and button while you advance the film mechanism for that. But again, with rangefinders, especially old ones like this, uh, recommend using a different camera for double exposures. So also not going to explain the science behind it in this video for that reason. Okay, anyway, that is my video. Oh, some things not to do with your Walls 35, Walls Envoy 35. Biggest one is don't let it sit in your car because the heat can cause the lubricating oils in the lens to get to places they shouldn't be because they'll get really thin. And then when they, when your camera gets back to temperature, they're in the wrong place, especially on your shutter leaves or uh, is a really bad place. And then your camera is less likely to work properly. Also the cold can cause those lubricating oils to break down. And that's a good way to have your lubricating oils get gummy and your camera not work quite as well. Another thing to bear in mind is that when you are done shooting for the day, always trigger your shutter because the shutter is completely clockwork. So when you arm the shutter by advancing the film lever, what's going to happen is you put a bunch of tension onto the springs and mechanisms. And if you leave them sitting like that for days or weeks or months, they can develop a memory and it can affect your shutter timing. In fact, most range finders have slow shutter speeds on the slow end including this one. The one second shutter speed is around two and a half seconds because the springs are a little bit older in it. So always remember to disarm your shutter. Next thing that you want to make sure you do is don't store it in a plastic bag or box because those are permeable and moisture can get in and cause fungus to grow on your leather or your optics. If you do need to store it in something like that, like a Pelican case, just make sure you have a rechargeable desiccant pack in there with it and that you keep it recharged. And just remember that your Walls Envoy 35 is a precision tool that should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you.